Hello and welcome to Kedem. Today we took a ride to the western hills of Judah to talk about wisdom, biblical wisdom, but not only biblical and not only wisdom, as we shall soon find out. Professor Samet of the Barelan University is a biblical scholar and a Assyrologist specializing in wisdom literature of ancient Near East. Welcome. Professor Samet, what is the biblical proverb literature? So what I want to talk to you about today uh, re regards several aspects of um, biblical studies. First is the question of critical study of the Bible. When critics look at the Bible, they ask themselves how the text came to be, uh, who edited it, how it developed. Um, I want to study or to explore this through the uh, test case of wisdom literature, uh, which is a broad term that I won't uh, define specifically now, but one of its expressions is proverb literature. And proverbs are known to us from many societies, ancient, modern. Uh, we also have proverbs in the ancient Near East. We have proverbs in the Bible, of course, in the book of Proverbs. And we have proverbs uh, in the ancient Near East, both in Egypt and in Mesopotamia. Uh, proverbs from Egypt are considered very important for the understanding and for contextualizing uh, the book of Proverbs because we have several parallels, famous parallels between uh, the book of Proverbs and Egyptian Proverbs. Uh, but we also have Proverbs in Mesopotamia, Sumer Proverbs mainly uh, from the third millennium BCE through to the second millennium and then later several translations into Akkadian. And as like as with any other biblical text, also with Proverbs, uh, biblical scholars ask themselves how it came to be, how it developed, what happened to it before it became the final form that we see with, uh, in front of us today. So just to have several examples of, to, to get a taste of how it looks like, we have um, random examples from Proverbs chapter 17. Um, a wise slave will dominate an incompetent son and will share the inheritance with the brothers. So this is about wisdom, and wisdom is the most important virtue according to proverb literature. Uh, let's see another one. Better is a dry bread crust with quiet than a house full of feasting with strife. So this is about uh, peace in, in the household. Um, and these are the typical uh, issues that um, biblical wisdom or biblical proverb literature is interested in. Grandchildren are the crown of the elders and the glory of children is their parents. So intergenerational relations, honor to the elders, etc. These are very typical, and this is how proverb literature looks like, not only in the Bible, but also outside the Bible. Uh, and here is one with a religious flavor in it, which is not exactly like what we saw before. It's also from chapter 17. Uh, one who justifies the wicked and one who condemns the righteous are both alike an abomination to the Lord. So this is about the judges in court. But here, it's not us. It's not the wise father who condemns them. It's the Lord. The Lord, they are abomination to the Lord. So we see that we have religious uh, content. We also have non-religious content. We will not call it secular. That would be an anachronism, but it's um, anthropocentric. It's very interested in the human behavior, in human success, etc. So this is more or less how proverb literature looks like. And here is what scholars ask themselves when they want to analyze the composition of the book. So first of all, of all, they are interested in the authorship and integrity. That is, who wrote the book? Was it one person? Was it a gradual process? Integrity, again, is it a unified book that was written uh, at one time uh, as is? Or is it something that was developed from um, several collections that uh, developed with time? If we can trace editorial activity, 
uh, what kind of editorial activity, what did the editor want to say? How did they pick specific proverbs but didn't pick others? Did they have an agenda? Uh, can we trace this agenda within their activity? And how the collections of proverbs came to be. Um, so let's begin with the question of authorship. The, uh, um, the book begins with a title that, that says, Mishlei Shlomo ben David Melch Israel, the proverbs of Solomon, son of David, king of Israel. And this would mean that uh, uh, on the face of it, Solomon is the author of the entire book. That's the first uh, verse in the book. And this is what the book tells us about itself. But when we or other um, um, biblical scholars uh, look further, we see that within the same book, we have um, other titles. We have the Proverbs of Solomon in chapter 10. Then we have uh, the words of Agul, son of Yake in chapter 30. Another wise person, Aluka, uh, again in chapter 30. Then we have King Lemuel in chapter 31. So the book itself tells us that it is made out of collections of proverbs and not all the collections are ascribed to King Solomon. So even without any external evidence, just from looking very carefully into the way the book presents itself to us, we can conclude that the book is not written only by King Solomon. Of course, uh, Chazal, the rabbis, tried to solve it by making King Lemuel and Agur San Vyakeh all uh, titles for King Solomon, but this is Midrash. If you want to look at the, what the book tells us, we have several authors. So what we have here is a kind of contradiction or at least gap between the title that ascribed the entire book to Solomon and then the um, subtitles of separate collections within the book that ascribe uh, with the materials within the book to several authors. Um, just a small um, um, comment about how do I know that you can see here, it's in uh, green in the slide, that the big title in 1.1, one, one, uh, Mishlei Shlomo ben David, the Proverbs of Solomon, does not refer to the first part, that is chapters one to nine, but refers to the entire book. So um, I'll just refer to it very briefly. First of all, there is, there is a convention of, uh, of scribes, of, of the editors of the book of Proverbs, um, that goes like that. If they include two collections by the same author, one after the other, they will use the word gum also in the second title. So for example, we find here the Proverbs of Solomon in chapter 10, and then we find these are two of the Proverbs of Solomon, gam ele mishlei shlomo, or the words of the wise. These two are the words of the wise, gam ele lachachamim. So um, if one, one, if the first uh, uh, verse in the book uh, was supposed to be only the title for the first chapters, then we would expect gam, uh, at the beginning of chapter 10. Also, we should say that Mishlei Shlomo ben David Melech Israel is very formal, uh, is very festive, I may say, so it looks more uh, like a title for the entire book. And um, also another consideration that I will also uh, refer to briefly is linguistic. The formula, Shlomo ben David Melech Israel is late. How do I know that it's late? It's only uh, found in the Book of Chronicles, as you can see here, that is um, from the Persian period or even later. So um, not only relative dating or relative considerations show us that Mishlei Shlomo ben David Melch Israel is later and refers to the entire book. Also, we have here something like absolute uh, dating. Okay, it's from Second Temple Times, so probably the scribe or the editor who wanted to ascribe the entire book of Proverbs to King Solomon, as opposed to what we find in the uh, titles of the sub-collections, lived in Second Temple Times. Um, I should also refer to another theory very briefly. Uh, some scholars think that even for the um, uh, titles of the sub-collections, uh, the royal ascription should be treated very cautiously. Why? Because 
when we find the Proverbs of Solomon or the Proverbs of King Lemuel, and then we look at the content, and the content is not royal, okay? What we find there are uh, verses dealing with everyday life of lay person. So for example, a child who gathers in summer is prudent, but a child who sleeps in harvest is, uh, brings shame. Or bad, bad says the buyer and goes away and boasts. These are two pictures, one from agricultural life, one from city life, but they do not regard kings. Kings do not plow and do not gather in summer and they do not go to the market and have to uh, negotiate or bargain the, the price of commodity. So some scholars say, if the content is civil and not royal, so the royal ascription in the titles, not only of the entire book, also of specific sub-collection is also secondary. That's another, I would say, theory or deduction of modern scholarship uh, of the authorship of the book of uh, Proverbs. Uh, another interesting theory regards uh, what we call religious uh, addition or religious uh, reduction. And reduction is like an addition, but it's a specific uh, uh, phrase of, of biblical scholars. So in some places in the book, we find that there are um, parallel proverbs, one of which is very anthropocentric and interested in human life. And the other takes it and looks like corrects it, even in a polemic tone to be a more uh, religious one. So for example, Mavet v'chayim b'yad l'shon v'ohaveha yochal pirya. Death and life are in the power of the tongue and those who love it will eat its fruits. So this means that uh, our speaking, our tongue is a very powerful tool. And this is a very important um, a principle of, of proverb tradition in, in Israel and outside it that we have the power to control our future, to design our life, to design our relationship with other people through our uh, correct speaking. And that, that, that's why the Lashon, the tongue controls it. But then we find Le'adam Ma'achei Lev Adonai Ma'ane Lashon in two chapters ahead, two ch chapter four, I'm sorry. The plans of the mind belong to humans, but the answer of the tongue is from Yahweh. So we can do nothing we cannot express our thoughts uh, using words without God doing it for us. This looks like two very contradictory approaches to how do we express words and who controls. And we have many, many examples, similar examples. So for another one, just one, but we have dozens of these. Torat chacham mekor chayim lasur mimok sheimavet. The teaching of the wise is a fountain of life so that one may avoid the snares of death. So how we de do we avoid the snares of death? How do we live good life? How we do we promise success? We have to listen to the Torah Chacham, to the teaching of the wise. So the source of wisdom, the source of authority, and the source of power is the wise person, maybe our father, maybe our teacher, who teaches us, us how to act. And this is also very typical of the proverb tradition. But then we found that someone took this uh, verse, this proverb, and tried to correct it. And then it says in, in, in chapter 14, So uh, the fear of God is a fountain of life so that one may avoid the snares of death. So someone was uh, not very happy with the original formulation. And the original formulations uh, formulation puts all the power into the hand of the wise men who carry the wisdom trad tradition on. And that editor said, no, I want to teach the young student that the fear of Yahweh is what's important. And we have so many examples like this here. You can see another one in the um, slide, but I don't have time to show it. But what we can see is that throughout the book of Proverbs, we have expressions of two different schools. One school is probably the traditional uh, wisdom school that believed in the human power to direct one's life. And the other one, maybe the later one, is more a uh, pious, is more oriented towards the fear of God. And they want to correct the message that is not pious enough for them and make the uh, Proverbs more 
um, in accordance with their the theology that probably has to do with prophetic school. And both left their traces within the book. We find these proverbs and these proverbs, and sometimes they're just next to one another. Sometimes they're apart, but we can see that we have uh, a more theological approach and a more anthropocentric approach. Uh, so what we see here is that um, there were some uh, um, wise um, scholars who did not agree with the anthropocentric view of traditional wisdom, and they tried to correct it in many ways. And we can see both the expression of their school and the expression of the older school within the book. Uh, another way of thinking about um, the formation of the Book of Proverbs critically is uh, how the collections came to be, because we saw before that we have several collections within the book and they are separate, originally perhaps separate from each other, and each of them has a title that ascribes it to a different sage or a different uh, king sometimes. Um, and sometimes scholars were, were able to see how the collections themselves show slight signs of uh, addition or reduction. So for example, there is a collection that's called Mishlei Shlomo, Proverbs of Solomon. It begins in chapter 10. And we can see that it uh, has two parts. The first part, first 15, uh, five chapters, has what we call contradictory parallelism. So for example, Ben Chacham Yisamach Av, Uven Ksil Tugat Imo. So we have a contradiction between the Ben Chacham and the Ben Ksil, the wise child and the foolish child. When the righteous prosper, the city exalts, and when the wicked perish, there are shouts of joy. So here righteous and here wicked. And this style, this is how the, all the first five uh, uh, chapters work. They have a contradictory parallelism. Then we go, we jump further to uh, the uh, second part of the co collection, and then we find a plain parallelism. The two parts of the verse say more or less the same in different words. So, How much better to acquire wisdom than gold? To acquire understanding is preferable to silver. So the same in different words, that's plain parallelism. A stupid son is grief for his father and a hair take for the woman who bore him, etc. Uh, so naturally, uh, um, scholars say, okay, so maybe this uh, collection is made out of two originally separate collection who had, which had different styles. Here, a contradictory parallelism, here, plain parallelism. And a nice um, support for that uh, uh, theory would be to look at what we have exactly in between the two parts. So what we see in between the two parts is a block of um, a fear of Yahweh, or fear of Lord uh, sayings. Yirat Adonai Musa Chochma, velifne kavod anava, le'adam marchei lev, u'me Adonai marchei ma'ane lashon, and many other like that. And this does not seem a coincidence. It looks like someone took the second part of the collection, which used to be a separate collection, and then composed an introduction. It was a pious introduction, and the introduction and that collection stood apart. And then someone else, a later editor, came and uh, integrated it with the first part of that collection. And this is how the biggest collection in the book, Mishlei Shlomo, came to be. Um, here, you, you can see it here, uh, the fear of Lord Block within, uh, with, in between the two uh, parts. Uh, so we can summarize what I said uh, up to now, now like this. There are many theories about how the book of Proverbs came to be. Who authored it? Uh, when did they leave, more or less? Is it a Solomonic, uh, a unified Solomonic creation? Probably not. Uh, did it have several editors? Probably yes. They had, several, they had different uh, orientations or different agendas in terms of religious content. Um, when was the final canonization or at least edition, reduction of the book done also in Second Temple times? So we have several theories, but what, what is common to all these theories is that they cannot be validated through hard data. 
And this is because we do not have this hard data. The only thing we have is the final form. We have the Masoretic text, and we can deduce from the Masoretic text how we think the book came to be and was developed on the basis of several hints that we find within that final text. We do have, we, I must admit that we do have something that is a little different. It's interesting there, um, excuse me. The Greek um, version, the Septuagint of the book of Proverbs uh, presents a separate recension, a separate edition of the book. And it has all kinds of edition and the different uh, sequence of the collections, etc. So it does give us a glimpse uh, to the history of the text, but it's not enough for us to say whether all these theories can be validated or not. We just don't have the data. And this is why I said before that um, proverb collections or pro the study of proverb collections uh, critically is just a test case, because this is the problem with the entire critical uh, school of biblical texts. We have, we, don't, we have no other choice but to work with the final text in most cases. In some cases, we have some kind of external evidence, but not enough to reconstruct the uh, uh, development of the text with certainty. What we have are theories. I think, personally, that they are convincing. But it's a, it's a question of personal taste. That's my taste. Another scholar may think that they're very unconvincing, inconvincing, I should say. So what um, I would like to do about that, and again, it's not just about that, it's a whole methodology that may apply to other biblical texts as well, is to use something, and this is, I think, innovative and an interesting um, approach, what is called empirical models for biblical criticism. Uh, this uh, term was coined by an important biblical scholar called Jeffrey Tigai, an American scholar. Um, and he suggested that in order for us to understand the way biblical texts were developed, and more importantly, in order to, for us to examine whether the theories we have are even valid or even possible, we have to turn our gaze to wherever we have better textual evidence, and that would be other cultures from the ancient Near East, mainly Mesopotamia, a little uh, from Egypt, uh, uh, Tigai and other uh, uh, scholars who cooperated with him also worked with um, uh, later texts, rabbinical texts, etc. Um, but as a, a methodology, I think that this is a very important tool that has not been recognized enough in scholarship and should be used more intensively. And this is what I want to do for wisdom uh, uh, or proverb uh, study. Here you can see on the slide other books that uh, more or less uh, tried to apply the same methodology to different uh, uh, texts. So the model I would like to examine is called the instructions of Shulpak. Shulpak is a name of an ancient city, Sumerian city. It's also a name of a person um, in some uh, texts. And um, the instructions of Shulpak are the oldest uh, wisdom text known in world literature in general. Uh, and it's a collection of instructions, also proverbs, but mainly instructions meaning uh, second person guidance to the sun on how to act in life. Um, the instructions of Shurupak um, include many um, uh, proverbs and instruction, and they are not. And what, what you can see here is several um, uh, tablets that include uh, copies of them from different periods uh, in cuneiform script, of course. And what's important about this. Uh, collection, in addition to it being very interesting in itself, is that we have a quite stable and detailed uh, history, textual history. So we have four, actually four editions, or at least four representations of the text. First of all, we have an archaic Sumerian version written in Sumerian language from the mid third millennium BC. This is very, very old. We don't have almost any other literary texts from this period, and not in Sumer, and not in any, any other known part of the world. 
that's that's old enough. And then we have a revised uh, longer um, uh, uh, version of it that that's usually called classic Sumerian version. And this comes from the second millennium BCE. That is a, a period from which we have more literary materials, especially in Sumerian, but not only. And then this Sumerian version was translated into Akkadian. And we know of this Akkadian translation from the end of the second millennium. So we are going downwards. And then we have a translation into the Hurrian language, which is, I don't have, I, we will need a separate lecture to speak about the Hurrian uh, culture, but this is a non-Semitic language that was dominant in the Hittite um, um, kingdom and the area in the late second millennium. Um, so four versions, and we can trace their development because we have several copies for each. For some, we have only some uh, few for the classic Sumerian version, we have more. And let's see what can we learn from this. So I want to begin from the archaic version. The archaic version has a prologue, then proverbial units, like the proverbial um, collections that we have in the book of Proverbs, each having, having its own um, uh, title. Here, we have proverbial units with opening, openings and concludings that separate them, and then an epilogue. The prologue says, and this is my translation from the Sumerian, it's just a short, uh, um, several uh, lines from it. The wise one, the learned one, who dwelled in the land, the man of Shurupak gave instructions to his son. So the father is identified. His name is either Shurupak or maybe the man of Shurupak. It depends in the difference between different copies of the uh, archaic version. But we know who he is. He's a man from the city of Shurupak, and he gives the instruction. And then we find five instructional units and an epilogue. The, the epilogue says the same. The man of Shurupak gave instructions to his son. Now I want to jump to the classic version. It's several centuries ahead. We're coming to the beginning of the second millennium BCE. And there we also find a prologue. Then three lengthy proverbial units. It's only three, but it's longer. It's approximately 1.5 times longer. And then the epilogue. Let's look at the prologue. And here we have a little surprise. The man of Shurupak gave instructions to his son. That's like the archaic version, okay? The man of Shurupak, the son of Ubar Tutu, gave instructions to his son. Ziu Sudra. These two figures, Ubar Tutu and more importantly, Ziu Sudra, are known to us from Sumerian mythology. Ziu Sudra is an important figure. He is the survivor of the flood in the Sumerian mythological tradition. He is also a king, of course, and he is a very important person. So if Ziu Sudra, the famous Ziu Sudra, is the son to whom these instructions were taught, the father is also, of course, a king and not just a king, he is a primordial king from the time before the great flood swept over the earth. So he's a very ancient king, a mythological one. He's absolutely promoted as compared to what we find in the uh, archaic version. He becomes a king and an important one too. Um, this, like what we saw in the biblical case, makes gaps between the content and the framework. Why? Because in the content, and what you can see here in the um, slide is the Sumerian um, transliteration and then the English translation. Uh, wh while the, the framework presents the man of Shurupak, the father, as a king, son of Ubar Tutu, father of Ziu Sudra, the content is also very civil and refers to everyday life of the regular Sumerian civilian. So, do not plow a field on a pathway. The result is tearing out of the boundary stone. Do not laugh with a girl if she's married. The slander will be strong. So kings do not care. They don't plow any, any field and they can laugh with uh, as many girls as they want. Nobody is going to uh, have anything against it. So it's clear that the editor who gave the uh, uh, classic Sumerian version 
uh, a royal framework did not bother himself with changing the content. He left the content civilian and then the framework is royal and the gap is there and it's okay with him. This is interestingly similar to what we saw in the book of Proverbs. In the book of Proverbs, I said before, biblical scholars just deduced from the final text that we have a royal framework that is secondary, that someone added after, or maybe in, uh, uh, as a second thought, after the civil content were, were, was already made. And like in the uh, Sumerian case, also in the biblical case, we see that there is a gap between the civil content that refers to a regular person and then the titles that refer to some times, and especially in the first uh, uh, verse in the book, to, to royal figures, to kings. And here too, we see that the editors that made this gap were not bothered by it. They didn't think that this should be corrected. They didn't uh, uh, correct the entire uh, co uh, content of the book of Proverbs and, and, and made it royal. They left it the way it is. What's interesting here is that in the Sumerian case, we can trace the process in the textual data. We see the uh, earlier stage from the archaic uh, version where the father was not royal yet. And then we see exactly when he became royal and what happened as a consequence to the entire uh, piece. Now let's look at the uh, theology a little. Uh, so the instructions of Shurupak are, very, uh, are a very good exemplar of what will later become uh, a proverb literature in the ancient Near East. They're very much interested in human life anthropocentric, as I, ca I called it before. Um, they are um, very rhetoric uh, in terms of explaining and motivating the son to follow the instructions. So they have what we call motive clauses. These are the rationals or the explanations why something should be done or should be obeyed. So for example, do not place a well in your field. People will turn hostile against you. Do not vouch for someone. The man will have a hold on you. Do not speak improperly. Later, it will bind you like a trap. So these are, everything is very, very typical. The concerns, the tone, the explanation, the rhetoric, everything is very wisdom-like. It's very proverb-like. What we don't have here in the archaic version is any mention of uh, divine punishment. They never tell you, do not do this and that because the God will uh, punish you. They never tell you anything in general about gods, about religious affairs. The entire archaic version as we have it before us is interested in human uh, uh, concerns and in the way humans control over the life and, and manage it. So I summarized it here. The archaic version never mentions God, gods, divine activity or any other religious element. What happens in the classic version? The classic version adheres more or less to the same uh, um, pattern, but it does add three proverbs that have a religious taste to them. And it's only three, but the editor locates them in strategic points within the work. So we said before that it has three units, right? At the end of unit one, we have a religious um, uh, saying about the god Utu, the god of uh, sun, the sun. Uh, the one and only warrior, he alone is equal of many. The one and only Utu, he alone is equal of many. Standing by the warrior, you shall live. Standing by Utu, you shall live. So you should stand by the god, you should obey him, you should work for him, etc. The unit two ends with a proverb about how important is prayer, supplication. Words of prayer bring abundance. Supplication is cool water that soothes the heart. And towards the end of unit three, the, the last unit of proverbs, we find a long uh, instruction that says how important it is to work both Utu and the personal God and compares Utu with the mother, the personal God with the father, um, so again, a religious thing. So we see that on the one hand, this editor was interested in adding religious content 
into the work. He was not happy with the non-religious nature of the work he had in front of him. On the other hand, he didn't change everything. He strategically located the uh, religious sayings in three important points within the work, thus making, I think, in his eyes, the work more, comp more, more compatible or more in accordance with the, some kind of religious um, um, spirit of the time that he thought was uh, um, necessary. Um, okay, so we just said that. And this is very interesting because again, it validates, and I think it validates, it's an afterthought. You know, the, the Bible scholars who suggested all these theories about how the book of Proverbs came to be, did not even know uh, the instructions of Shurabak, some of them, and, prob and most, of course, they didn't know uh, the details of how it developed. So it's not inspired by it. It's an afterthought. So after these theories about the addition of a religious layer into the book of Proverbs, were already suggested by many biblicists. Here we come and we find something very, very similar, a parallel process in a Sumerian uh, a text that uh, can be reconstructed on the basis of textual history that we do not have in the biblical text. The last thing that I would like to examine from this comparative point of view is how the um, uh, formation of the uh, uh, units, or in the biblical case of the collection, uh, works. So uh, when you compare the archaic version of the instruction of Shurupak to the classic version, you can see that the, we see that here we have five units and we have, here we have three. If we follow the content, we see that the three first units in the archaic version became the first unit of the classic version plus additional material. And then we have the fourth unit that became the, the second unit here, and the fifth unit that became the third unit here. We can trace it and we can see how editors take two different units that were different in the orig original that they have in front of them, and they merge them into one bigger unit. And this is very similar to what was suggested by biblical scholars about one of the uh, collections that we just followed, the collection that begins in Proverbs 10. We have contradictory parallelism, then we have plain parallelism, in the middle we have fear of Yahweh block, and they were all integrated into one uh, big um, unit, but this is also, again, um, based on the deduction or the guess or the judgment of biblicists, while the parallel case in the Sumerian a transmission of wisdom material is based on textual data. So uh, some conclusions. Um, first of all, what we showed is that we can trace very, very similar processes of reduction and addition of the biblical material and of the Sumerian material. Uh, in, this, we, in both, we see uh, the, the use of opening and concluding formulas to reframe wisdom materials and to make them royal. In both, we see that this creates gaps between the content and the framework. In both, we see that some editors at some point of the transmission of the piece was not happy or were not happy, happy with the uh, non-religious uh, uh, flavor of the work and they tried to make it more religious, not by uh, deleting, but by adding some uh, religious content. And in both, we see that the patterns of growth, the way it grows, are uh, quite similar. Um, I think that's what, what's important in what I did here is not only for understanding uh, uh, biblical wisdom, uh, which is nice. It's not only for understanding biblical wisdom in context as compared to uh, the instructions of Shurupak. Its most important uh, uh, potential is in the tool that it suggests us to examine uh, critical theories about any other part of the Bible uh, that are sometimes dismissed because people say, okay, that's a nice theory, but the only thing we have is the final text. And when we can see that very similar processes uh, in very similar genres 
were uh, uh, common in the ancient Near East, uh, where we have uh, textual based evidence, that's, I think, a very nice illustration for the entire project of critical thinking about the Bible, modern critical thinking about the Bible. Could you answer one question regarding the King Solomon and his asso association with this uh, Mishle proverb? There is any chance that at least parts, uh, parts of the Proverbs uh, were written in the times of King Solomon? Yes, I think there is. I think unlike there is another, there are some two other books uh, in the Bible that are uh, ascribed to Solomon. That would be Song of Songs and Ecclesiastes Kohelet. The case of Kohelet, I think the answer is big no. There is no chance that it was written by King Solomon or in the time of King Solomon. Uh, but in the case of uh, Proverbs, that's much more complicated. Uh, what I said is that we cannot ascribe the entire book to Solomon, and I stand by it, and I think I showed why. But the fact that some of the uh, uh, collections are uh, ascribed to Solomon, okay, the, or specifically the biggest one, and the fact that we have a strong uh, tradition of Solomon identified with the idea of wisdom, although some scholars would say it's a late one, but still it's there, um, uh, does not exclude the possibility that some of these collections were uh, are at least as early as the time of Solomon. I cannot say it's impossible. Um, I can also say that I once had a very interesting project um, that was trying to date specific proverbs within the book on a linguistic basis to see which language they uh, match which uh, phase of the Hebrew language they match and to see whether they are pre-exilic or post-exilic. Um, it was very difficult. It can be, it, it can be said that uh, many proverbs within the book are uh, post-exilic. We can find some, there are some I wrote about it, but it's, it's not uh, very common. And what we do find in the book, especially in the first part of the book, are contacts with uh, Phoenician, and northern uh, traditions. And these, I think, would go, or at least it's a possibility that they would go to earlier uh, times in terms of, of biblical dating. So the short answer is yes, we cannot exclude the possibility that some parts of the book were written or collected and or collected in the time of King Solomon. Okay, Professor Samet, thank you very much for being with us and uh, sharing your knowledge. Thanks. My pleasure.